I when I sent him the he asked me for a bio, I said just just abbreviate it any way you want to. I don't think he abbreviated anything. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, it's been a great journey in my uh, walk with the Lord. Uh, I would have never dreamed at nine years old after accepting Christ and then walking with Him and feeling the call to ministry would be so amazing. You know, one of my goals as a child was that I would be able to be a forest manager. That way I didn't have to talk to anybody. I didn't, I didn't like talking to people. <laughs> Uh, as a kid, we lived out in the country and I would play for hours by myself, you know, uh, just because I could be alone, I could think about things and, and, and do my own thing. But you know what? God has a different plan for us, doesn't he? And ultimately, it's not about our plan, it's about his. And one of the things, a while ago, the song was about Crown him. Crown him, Lord. If Hong Kong or your home areas are ever going to see Jesus make a difference, it's going to start with us. It's going to start with us making Jesus truly the Lord of our life. You see, the reality is, so many times, Jesus is a friend, he's a savior, he's a loving Lord, he's a great God, as long as he doesn't require anything. And as long as it doesn't make me have to change anything about my life. But that's not where we are. Peter is writing in this third chapter of 1 Peter, He's writing to a group of Christians who are persecuted for their faith. They're not persecuted because they're going along with everybody else. They're persecuted because they are standing up for the truth of God's Word. They are presenting the message of the cross. They are sharing the salvation possibility that Christ would give. And as a result of all of that, we find that there is, there's a lot of struggle going on. And Peter, in verse 15, in the New American Standard Version, it says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks of you, to give an account of the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. I also think just a moment about this word, this concept of sanctifying Christ as Lord. You see, outside of the Bible, this Greek word is never used as a verb. It is always used as a noun. And that makes a difference. But when you get to the point of this, there is a sense in which it is saying, you and I have an action to do. You and I have a part that we have to, 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 to play. And it says that we are to sanctify Him as Lord. And when I'm going to sanctify Christ as Lord in my life, it means that I declare Him sacred to me, I declare Him holy to me, I declare that I am going to lift him up above everything else. As a matter of fact, it is interesting that this same word sanctify here is the same word, root, used when Jesus tells us how to pray when he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Many times we don't think about that word hallowed. We don't even know what it means most of the time. We just kind of go, well, that's a nice sounding word, and, and it's a nice sounding thought. But what it's saying is, sanctify Jesus, Lord of your life. Sanctify God in your life. Make Him a part of all that you're doing. I hear people a lot of times who will say, 
I had an awesome day, and I had an awesome uh, hot dog, or I had an awesome meal, or I had an awesome something. I want to ask you to do something. Reserve the word awesome, or any equivalent you have in your language for that, to God and God alone. Because it is Him and Him only who is our Lord and Savior. It is Him and Him only who gives us life. Because outside of Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as life. And we need to help people around us understand that we serve a God who is awesome, a God who is, who is great. And we need to reserve a place in our life so that we state publicly, privately, personally that God is the one who is awesome to us. And so we sanctify Him as Lord in our heart. We make Him the one that is most important in our life. When we talk about, I mentioned to our, our church this morning when we were talking about uh, Hong Kong and the Christians here in Hong Kong. You know, a lot of people for a lot of years have shared the gospel. A lot of people for a lot of years have sent missionaries to Hong Kong and a lot of things like that. But the percentage of Christians here is it's still extremely low. But I very often talk to people who I can ask, who have you shared Christ with recently? And they would say, no one. I've talked to people who w would have a family member dying. And I would go, have you ever had a chance to share the gospel with them? Oh, no. I wouldn't want to do that. It would be embarrassing. Listen, we have to come to a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is more important to us than our embarrassment. Where Jesus is more important to us than any other thing in our life. And we need to come and say, God, I understand that Jesus is the only way of salvation. He is the one and only one. I know in our world, our world talks about it being multiple ways. Even among Christians, we talk about it having multiple ways. I shared with our church this morning a, a recent survey of Christians in the United States who declare themselves to be born-again Christians. 70% of them said there is another way to heaven other than Jesus also. You may not believe that but you may act that way. You know what? We sometimes will talk about, among our friends, that Jesus is the only way. And then work with someone else. Work with an employer, or work with an employee, or work with someone else, and know that they're not Christians, they're good people, and we'll, we'll say, okay, I don't really have to share Christ with you know what we've just said? We've just said there must be another way. But folks, there isn't. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that is the Holy One of God. When Peter makes his confession of faith, he says, you are the Holy One of God. You are the only hope we have. Who else could we go to to learn where truth would be? You are that truth. When we sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord in our life, it's where we acknowledge that there is no hope outside of Jesus. And you know what? Jesus didn't come to save us. And this may shock you. Jesus did not come to save us from hell. Do you realize that? Jesus came to give us life. He came to give us something we could not have any other way. 
And so we need to recognize that we need to come to a place where we fear the Lord and revere the Lord. Where we love Him. And, you know, some people will look and say, well, you know, there's the God of the Old Testament that was mean and bad and ugly and, and He used to destroy people. And then there's Jesus, the New Testament God, who's very loving and caring and all that. You know what, folks? It's been the same God all along. If you go back into the Old Testament, it's sitting there and saying constantly, I hate the death of the wicked. I want all people to come to a relationship with me. But they've got to come to a place in their life where they revere me and hold me in awe and fear me as Lord. Because, you know, if you and I always talk about just a loving God, then people who are living with their sin can come to believe that it really doesn't matter whether or not they repent of their sins or not because there's a loving God that just is going to overlook their sin. However, God doesn't portray Himself that way. God is a loving God. He sent Jesus Christ to die in our place not to forget about our sins because God doesn't forget our sins. He forgives our sins. He doesn't, he doesn't overlook our sin. He pays our sin debt. And it'd be like if, if um, I, I look at Oso and I go, okay, Oso, here's an IOU and I'm going to give you an IOU and it's $500 I'm going to owe you. Well, as long as that IOU isn't paid, then I still owe him the money. But what if his wife said, all right, I've got $500 right here, so I will pay that IOU on behalf of Butch. You know what? Oso's never going to ask me and never going to collect on the IOU from me because the debt is canceled. Jesus dying on the cross did not forget your sinfulness and my sinfulness. Jesus dying on the cross gave a possibility for our debt to be canceled out because of our commitment to Him. Some people approach God and they're very afraid of God. And uh, they, they, don't, they don't know how to live in that. Matter of fact, you know, let me, let me illustrate it this way. My mother would say to my brother and sister and myself, she would say, no jumping on the bed. <laughs> Anybody, I, I think they've heard that type of phrase before. No jumping on the bed. And you know, as a kid, you many times, don't have spatial thoughts worked out in your brain as far as how everything is laid out. And I would always, I, my brother and I, we knew that in order to get to our bedroom, we would leave the kitchen, we would walk down the long hallway, we would enter our bedroom. We never really paid any attention to the fact that our bedroom wall and the kitchen wall were the same wall. Okay? We weren't thinking that way. And we're bouncing on the bed. We're jumping on the bed. It's a fun thing to do, honestly. It is so fun. So, so we're sitting there, we're jumping on the bed. The next thing we hear is mom coming down the hallway. Well, we dive off the bed and we make it up as two little boys would as quickly as possible. And it didn't look very nice. When mom turned the corner, do you think we were excited to see her? No. Because we were thinking mom was probably angry with us. Many of you right now are looking at God as if he's an angry God coming after you. But let me share with you this. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, 
He has forgiven your sin. Amen. Past, present, future. Acknowledge your sin, that's, that's necessary. Repent of your sin, that's necessary. But, I want you to know, we have a God who loves us and we need to revere Him in that sense. When we talk about sanctifying the Lord, as Christ as Lord in our life, we need to be at a point where we submit ourselves to God. In James chapter 4, there is a wonderful passage that deals with the idea of coming back into a right relationship with God. James is written to a Christian group. And he tells us to walk through that step of moving back into a relationship with Him. But he says, when we walked outside, one of the things we need to do is we need to submit to God. When I sanctify Christ as Lord in my life, I submit to Him. This word submission is the idea of, of also stand right here, okay? All right. Let's, let's pretend, we're only going to pretend, okay? We're going to pretend that Oso is a king. Okay? King Oso. All right. So, Oso is the king. This is the picture. I mean, you think about it. The king in the day that this was written, was the ruler over your very life. The king could demand you to be destroyed in a moment's notice and no one would know the difference. When we submit to the king, or we submit to Christ as our king, the picture is, is that we totally give ourselves over to him and his command. And this is the view. So, as we submit to God, we are saying, God, I lay everything down before you. Amen. Everything is yours. Amen. I want you to be in control of my life. I want you to be in charge of everything. I want to let you know that you can take everything I've got and everything is okay. You are a good God when things are good. You're a good God when things are bad. You're a good God, period. Because no matter what, You've given me life. And so when you and I come before God, we submit to Him. We, we prepare a heart. And, and we want to we live out our life in a way where God is glorified in our life. We want to try and make sure that we are living with God in mind. You know what? If I were to ask this, you know, we had the cardboard testimonies a while ago. If we really had the true cardboard testimonies of all of us, listen to this. In 1 Corinthians, that was a church that was really messed up, wasn't it? That's a church just like us. It's a church that looks just like us. <clears throat> In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, in verses 9 through 11, listen to what it says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then... There are five amazing words that say such were past tense, some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. That means God made you holy, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. 
You know, God isn't sitting there and saying, I remember back when you used to do and you put it into play. God is looking at you and saying, I want you to know I died for you, I love you, and I ask you to give your heart and your soul and your strength and everything to me because I have forgiven you of all that. I have cleansed you of all that. And you, along with the Corinthians, me, along with the Corinthians, can say such were some of us. God is an amazing God. He has sanctified us through His body being given on the cross. And we want to be a people who understand that as we are sanctifying Christ as Lord of our life, there are some things we can do that will help us to catch a vision of who God is. If we're going to be a church that makes a difference in Hong Kong, then we're going to be a church that needs to be working from the truth of God's Word. Because when we are sanctified, we are sanctified personally. We, we lift Christ and we sanctify Him and make Him holy or, or sacred in our own life. But when we personally are being sanctified, the Word of God is what's going to do that working through our life. When I was younger, I liked to explore caves. And that was always fun. You'd find some amazing things in caves. But I remember one time when we were in a cave and we found a formation that was rather interesting and it was highlighted. This formation was a, a stalactite hanging down. And it had is a piece of limestone that was jet black, just like this mic here. But there was a section that was about six inches wide right down the very front of it that was snow white. And I was asking the guy that was taking us into that part of the cave, how did that do that? And he said, it's simple. You let water drip through a rock long enough, it finally takes out all the impurities and what you're seeing is all this black were just the impurities of the rock. And the white is where all the impurities have been cleaned away. I want you to know that the Word of God is working in your life. As you put the Word of God into your life, as you pour it in daily, it's like that water going through that rock. You're going to become a person who is much more aware from day to day of things you need to correct, things you need to do differently, things you need to, to grow in and, and move forward in. And we give ourselves over to God and His Word we pray and we allow all that to just work in our life. Ultimately, our desire is not only to sanctify Christ as Lord in our life so that we honor Him, but to also sanctify Christ as Lord in our life so that we personally begin to look more like Christ. You see, when we begin to look more like Christ, the world around us has to notice. Has to. Constantly I talk to Christians who will say, my neighbor asked me why I'm no longer cursing. And you'll go, okay, share with me that. Well, I became a Christian and my language changed. And my neighbor doesn't understand that. Someone doesn't understand why you do something nice. Someone doesn't understand why you, why you look at something differently. Someone doesn't understand why you forgive in a culture that's, that's bent on harboring grudges. You notice that? Someone doesn't understand why you're polite in a culture that politeness and, or rudeness is just common. 
People don't understand that. People don't understand why. I mean, I've got, I've got several lost friends that cannot understand why I want something good for them. And they're asking. They haven't become Christians yet, but they're asking. Some of you work in situations where you've got people who are nightmares to work for. But God knows that. Do you know that that's probably why God has you there? Because He knew that if you sanctify Him in your life, and if you allow the Word of God to flow through your heart, and you become the conduit by which that person sees the love of God, you will impact them in ways no one else can. Listen, every single individual will come into contact with a totally different group of people and have an opportunity to share Christ. As the church, we need to remember the future of the church doesn't depend on you. It depends on the lost. Did you know that? Because if we don't lead the lost to come to know Christ, there isn't a future church. So you and I need to sanctify Christ as the Lord of our life. Lift Him up. Share Him with others. Submit to Him as our Lord and our King. Allow His Word to flow through us, cleaning us, and directing us and allowing our lives to glorify the Lord. May God bless you as you continue to be the church and be a church that honors Him. Amen. Amen.